Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down how I made this pretty cool set extension using Blender, After Effects, and some stock footage. This isn't going to be step by step obviously because that would take like 3 hours, but we'll be touching on some pretty cool things like scattering objects using geometry nodes, creating mats to combine textures, and some non-standard array modifier tips to name a few. So stick around while I guide you through the general process of how I made this comp to get to some pretty cool stuff. Starting off, we first need to track our footage so that we get a virtual camera's movement as close as possible to our real camera's movement. This is basically a make it or break it step. If you can't get a good track, your final product won't look believable because it won't move correctly relative to the footage. I go over tracking in a bunch of my videos, so to save myself from repeating the same thing, you can check out my kitchen ghost compositing video where I made it real difficult for myself by shooting with my phone instead of a DSLR and also shooting in the dark. So there are plenty of tracking tips to be found in that one if you're interested. Really quickly for this footage though, I just brought it into Blender using the visual effects preset to bring up the motion tracking workspace right away, loaded in my footage, and then made sure my end frame was set to the end frame of the footage. Then I set the tracking correlation to 0 0.9, meaning Blender should stop tracking if the marker is less than 90% confident, made Blender auto-detect features to get a bunch of starting markers, then tracked forward through the footage. Then I just repeated the auto-detect features a few times. Skipping forward to what we can only hope is a decent track of our footage, we can both test the track as well as start blocking out our set extension using some real basic primitives. Using the tracking markers as guides, I'll place a plane down and try my best to align it with what I think the height of the water would be. Then we can just play the sequence to see how locked down the plane feels. If it's moving as expected and doesn't feel like it's sliding around or floating, we're looking golden. Now that we have the height of the water more or less figured out, I'll block out the rough shape of what the cave should be by adding a cube and raising it just above the water plane. Then I'll tab into edit mode, select a face, and start extruding the cube out to shape the cave a bit by pressing E. The blockout doesn't need to be super detailed because it's just going to be the base we'll be sculpting onto to make it rocky, but that doesn't mean it's not important. It's always a good idea to block stuff out before you start working in higher detail so that you can make sure you're happy with the proportion and placement of everything. Speaking from personal experience, if I realize too late into a project that something like that feels off, I'm a lot more likely to just ignore it because it takes a lot more work to fix problems as more detail is added. The last part of prepping the scene is going to be trying to match the lighting to the footage a bit, and the best way to do that for an outdoor scene like this is using an HDRI which you can find loads of for free. To apply one, just head to the shading tab, switch it over to world shading mode, and if you've enabled the node wrangler add-on that comes with Blender, just hit Ctrl or Command T with the background node selected, and it'll get everything more or less set up. Then all you need to do is select the HDRI as your input texture and then use the mapping node to rotate it around and try to align the sun in the HDRI with where the sun would be in your footage. Now that we've got the scene set up more or less, we need to actually make the stone cliff. And what's really going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us here is sculpting using rock brushes. I've tried a few and the best one I found was this one on BlendSwap. I'll leave a link in the description but all you have to do is log in and you can download it for free. After you download it, it's just going to give you a Blender file, so make sure to put that somewhere you'll remember because anytime you want to use the brushes in a project, you'll have to go to File, Append, Find the Rock Brushes Blender file, select the brushes, and then import them. Now that we've got the brushes loaded in, we can't just start using them on our mesh because we don't have a lot of geometry to work with. So to fix that, let's remesh our cave block out first. If you head over to the sculpting layout, then down to remesh, without changing any settings, we should get a good deal more to work with, but you can see that it's still not a ton. Ultimately, it really just depends on your scene and how detailed your asset needs to be. If it's far enough from the camera, this might be plenty, but if not, we have to undo and remesh it again with smaller settings, making sure to step it down slowly because this can be a bit intense. In fact, I'm going to swap this out for a simplified mesh for the sake of my computer, having to deal with this and recording at the same time. Alright, now we're good to start using our rock brushes. All you have to do is select one, click and drag outwards on the mesh until you're happy with the placement, and then let go to apply it. And there's a bunch of brushes to work with in this pack, but two of my favorites for adding harder edged sections are number 17 and 20. And don't forget you can always adjust the brush's strength to increase or decrease the effects. And now you're pretty much just set to go crazy with them. I think the best workflow is to start big and work your way down, so maybe try adjusting the overall form using the elastic deform tool, then come in with some bigger rock brush placements, and then finally go in with some of the more textured brushes to spice things up. After you've got a decent looking sculpt, we can take it a little bit further by scattering some rock assets on our mesh using geometry nodes. Essentially what we're going to do is import some rock assets and put them in a collection, and then we'll generate random points on our mesh and place rocks from that collection onto those points. And then to be able to control where they'll be scattered, we'll weight paint on the mesh and use that data to drive where the rocks are allowed to be. This same technique can be used to scatter grass, trees, bananas, you name it. So it's something you could probably use in any project you do. I'll get started by importing some rock assets, selecting them all, and then hitting M to add them to a new collection. Then selecting the object we want to scatter things on, head over to the Geometry Nodes tab and hit New. 
We'll hit Shift A to add our first node, and then S to search for one called Distribute Points on Faces. Putting it in between the input and the output should automatically hook it up, and you'll see right away that we've got a bunch of random points instead of our mesh. Next, we're gonna flip this from random to Poisson disk because it gives a little more control over the distribution, like being able to set a minimum distance between points. Next, we'll add the instance on points node so that we can add instances, in this case rocks, on the points. And to tell it we want rocks to be on these points, we'll add the collection info node next. And using that, we'll select the collection that has our rocks and plug that into the instances. This won't look right right away because by default, it's just instancing our entire collection on every single point instead of randomly picking one of the rocks to place on each. So to fix that, just enable separate children and pick instance. By default, Blender is also going to look at each of our assets position, rotation, and scale relative to the world origin to decide how they'll be instanced on our points. To counter that, just enable reset children. This might make all the assets look really big or small for now, but we can easily fix that. And what's important is that they're all gonna be instanced on the points properly, regardless of where they're positioned. Now to actually merge our rocks with our original cave mesh, let's add the join geometry node and put it at the end, then plug in our original geometry input. We can't just leave it like this though. To make it look at least somewhat believable, we need to randomly scale and rotate the rocks so that they look a little more varied. Luckily, we can get that done real easily using the random value node. We basically just wanna hook this up to the scale of our instance on points node and change the min and max scale to whatever we want. And same goes for the rotation. If you'd like a little bit more control over each axis, you can add the combine XYZ node and then plug separate random value nodes into each of the axes. Now, this is pretty great, but we don't want rocks to be scattered everywhere. If we want to be a bit more selective and choose where to scatter them, we can use weight painting to our advantage. So let's switch over to weight paint mode, quickly paint along the top here, and then in the object data panel, rename our vertex group to rock scatter by control clicking it, because this is where our vertex paint data is going to be stored. Now to bring that data back into geometry nodes, we need to first drag a connection out from an empty input property, and since we'll be using it to control the distributed points, I'll just plug it right into the density factor. Now in the modifiers panel, there's gonna be a new input here. So to tell it we wanna use our weight painting, just toggle the attribute selector, and we should now be able to see whatever we named the vertex group. And it's that easy. If you wanna modify where stuff gets scattered, you just have to head back to the weight painting and either add more area with weight set to one or remove area with weight set to zero. Now, after scattering rocks, I also duplicated a few, took them out of the rock asset collection so they weren't being scattered, scaled them up, and then manually placed them around to break up some of the forms and have a little bit more control over the final look. Now for the texturing, what I did was pretty straightforward for the most part, just downloaded a rock texture and set up a basic material, smart UV projected to lazily unwrap the thing, and then scaled the UV islands up a ton so that the texture was tiled a bunch, giving us more detail instead of being stretched over the whole mesh. One thing I did do to make it more visually complex and match the reference footage a bit more was to texture paint a mat and use that to apply a moss-like texture to parts of the rock. Since I scaled up the UV islands a bunch for the rock material, we can't just texture paint using those UVs because whatever we paint will just tile like the rock texture does since the islands extend past the UV square. The fix for this is just to create another UV map for our texture painting. That way we have one set of UVs being used to apply the rock texture and another UV map being used to texture paint on the mesh without tiling. So to set this up in the object data panel, you just have to click the plus under the UV map section, control click to rename the new map, and I'll name mine Moss Texture UV. Making sure you have the new map selected, but the original one is still set to the active render map, we can now head back to the UV editing view. From here, we could just smart UV project again and call it a day, but since I know I won't be needing moss on a large part of the mesh, we can be smart about how we unwrap it so that the parts that we need can take up more space and we can have a higher quality mat. To do that, for now, I'll just scale everything down to a spec using S and then press G to move it outside of the UV square. Then make sure you have UV sync selection on so that anything we select on the mesh is also selected on the UV. With face selection mode and X-ray enabled, we can select parts of our mesh now that we know we'll be adding moss to, hit U, and then smart UV project just those selected faces. Then we can move the rest of the UV islands back into any spare area of the UV square. So now we have the important areas taking up most of the space to maximize texture quality and the spots we won't be painting on are taking up no room at all. And now we're set to actually texture paint. So switch to the texture paint mode and in the active tool panel, make sure to set the mode to single image, hit new texture, and then set the size to 4K for that sweet, sweet detail by multiplying the initial value by four. Then I'll name the file Moss Texture Mat and hit okay. Now we can go ahead and start painting our mat, but our default brush is probably not gonna be the best bet for sparse moss. So we can really quickly just make a basic mossy brush by heading to the texture panel, create a new brush, and set the type to clouds. And now under colors, just set the brightness to 0.2 and the contrast to about five. Then you just have to right click and make sure you're painting with white and start tapping to paint our moss mat. 
When you're done, make sure you head back to the active tool panel and click save all images to save our moss texture mat. Then we'll head over to the shading layout and we'll make our moss. I'll select the principled BSDF node that's being used for the rock texture, hit shift D to duplicate it and move it over to the side. Then with it selected, hit control T so that node wrangler adds a texture coordinate, mapping and image texture nodes for us. We'll connect up our new shader to the output for now and if we set the image texture to our moss texture mat, it's gonna look not right. And that's because our texture coordinate node is using our original UV map and passing that to the mapping node. To make it use the UV map we just made, all we have to do is add a UV map node, choose our moss texture UV, and plug that into the mapping vector instead. Now that we have our moss mat fixed up, we're good to go. We'll first drop in a mix shader node and connect that to the output, then plug our moss texture mat into the factor. Now the first shader slot will be used wherever our mat is black, and the second shader slot will be used wherever the mat is white. So just plug the moss texture into shader 2, and the rock texture into shader 1, and we should see we're getting both our rock shader and moss shader blended together. Something to keep in mind with what we just did is we can repeat that however many times we want by creating more UVs, more mats, and more shaders, and just layering them on top of each other to layer a bunch of basic materials, and through the mats, create something that's a lot more detailed and unique. Now let's go over some tips related to making these background assets. I used the array modifier to save time while making the platform and bridge, so let's just touch on how. I started off by adding a cube to the scene and scaling it to be plankish, and then added the array modifier to it. Then I added a new empty to the scene, and instead of using relative offset for the array on the plank, I chose object offset and picked the new empty. Now I'll probably see a cube pop up instead of a plank because we need to apply the scaling we did while turning the cube into the plank, so just hit Control A with our plank selected, choose scale, and we should be all good. Now since the plank and the empty both have their origin in the exact same place, we won't see anything happening, but if we start to rotate the empty, you'll notice the arrayed copy of the plank is also rotating. And if we increase the count, they'll continue to rotate based off the offset between our original plank and our empty. Now if we select the plank again and head into edit mode and start sliding the plank over, you should start to see how the platform was made. Since moving it in edit mode keeps the origin where it is, the offset between our plank and the empty hasn't changed positions at all. The only offset between the empty and the plank is the rotational offset around their shared origin. So if we just increase the count a bunch, we can get a radial platform set up fairly quickly. Then what I did was go into edit mode again in top view with vertex select mode and x-ray enabled. I box selected the vertices at the end of the plank and scaled them up until they almost joined their copies and did the same with the vertices at the base of the plank. And just like that, we have a pretty nice looking radial platform. And a fun bonus is if you want to make a spiral staircase, just select the original plank and move it downward slightly. Wow. If you want to avoid accidentally making a spiral staircase though, all you have to do is select the plank, then select the empty and hit Control or Command P to parent the plank to the empty, which is convenient because now we can move it around by moving around the empty, which also happens to act as a clear marker where the middle of the platform is. Now for the bridges, instead of using the object offset on planks, I used a combination of the array modifier and the curve modifier to array the planks, but then make them follow a bezier curve. To do that, first I created a new bezier curve, and in edit mode I positioned the bezier points to form whatever curve I wanted the bridge to follow. Then I added the array modifier to my plank again, but kept it on relative offset and changed the factor to be whatever direction made sense for the plank. Next I added the curve modifier and selected the bezier curve as the curve object. And since we moved the bezier in edit mode and didn't move the curve object itself, the curve and the plank should have the same origin. If the origins match but it's still not following the curve how you'd expect, you probably just have to flip through the deform axes until you find the one that fixes it. Something I did both to the bridges and the platform after I was happy with them was apply their modifiers. So now there isn't a single plank anymore, but an object that has all of the planks. To separate them into their own objects, all you have to do is go into edit mode, hit A to select all, P to separate, and then choose by loose parts. Now each plank is its own object, and thankfully since we parented the original plank to the empty earlier, all of our planks are still children of it. Now the reason I broke up the array was so that we can do things like select a bunch of them and randomly push them down slightly or pull them up a little bit just to mess them up and make them look less perfect. One last tip on that note is adding variation to their materials. I'll select one plank and then add a basic wood material to it, then hop into the UV editor and Smart UV Project to get better UVs since the original UV was created for the default cube. I'll rotate the UV island because I want the grain to face the right direction, and then in object mode select all of the planks, and holding shift reselect the one with the material so it becomes the active element. Then with control or command L you can link their materials as well as copy their UVs from our active element to the rest of the copies. So now they all share the same wood material, but despite that we can introduce some random variations so that they all have a slightly different look. All you have to do is hop into the shading layout and add two nodes, object info and color ramp. 
If we plug the random socket into the color ramp factor and then plug that into the shader's color, you can see that we get a random range from black to white being applied to each of the planks. Then if we go ahead and add the mix RGB node and hook it up to our shader's color, we can plug the color ramp into color two, our wood material color into color one, and then set the blend mode to multiply and max out the factor. Now we can use the black value of our color range to choose how dark the plank variation can get, and we can also influence the saturation by introducing color as well. One more thing we can do with the object info node is plug the random value into the mapping node's location with the math node in between set to multiply. This makes it so each plank's UV is being offset by a random amount, making it less obvious that this is just the same plank being arrayed. And we can make the offset more varied by just increasing the multiplication amount. <sighs> Anyways, that's enough Blender for this video. Hopefully you picked up something new to use in your own projects. But now let's quickly go over the process of compositing the render in After Effects. Rendering the sequence out at 500 samples using cycles took me about 18 hours of overnight rendering, so that sucks, but I was left with some decent quality to work with. One of the many shortcuts I took was instead of actually running any water simulations, I just added volumetric fog all along the outside of the cave around water levels so that in After Effects I could key out the green and get a hacky height pass to fade the rocks out as they got lower below the water. This clearly wasn't perfect, but I decided I needed to stop tweaking things and just release the video, so hopefully you didn't notice that until I just pointed that out. The next step in compositing this was to try and match the white and black values as best as I could, meaning the darkest and the brightest points of the footage should match the darkest and brightest points of the render. So using the levels effect, I just matched the dark cave's black point with the black points in the lighthouse, but it was a bit tougher to find reference for the white point, so I just eyeballed it and tried to land somewhere between the lighthouse rocks and the cliff face behind it. After matching the black and white points, I tried to tackle the shadow tones and value using Lumetri Color. Luckily the footage provided some really good reference, so it was just about lowering the overall shadows, and then trying to nudge their tone closer and closer to the reference using the color wheels. And that was pretty much it for the compositing. Now, this whole time you might have been wondering why I never talked about the elephant in the room. Or should I say duck in the water, am I right guys? Yeah. Well that stupid bit was brought to you by the folks over on Twitter. Before most videos, I do a no context poll where I ask you to vote on something without context and whatever wins makes its way into the next video. So if that sounds dumb, it's because it is. And if you're into dumb things, why don't you follow me over on Twitter? Also, this episode's sponsored by me. I've set up a coffee page where I can start dropping little goodies for you like the duck model, which I've just uploaded. It's free, but I've set it up as a pay what you want type deal. So if you feel like supporting the channel and my coffee addiction, you can send me a couple bucks, but don't feel weird about just entering zero when grabbing it for free. It's all good either way. You can find the link in the description right below the like and subscribe buttons. So I mean, if you haven't already, you should probably just hit those on the way down. Bye.